Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are so excited to have you here today, and we are going to be talking about language delays with a very special guest that we have, Dr. Evan Lippman. Hi, everybody. There she is. Okay, so we're so happy that you joined us. Um, so let's just, we'll get started, but here is uh, the topic. Um, I know many of you often have questions about your younger children or your older children about whether or not there might be a speech and language delay. And, and today we're going to find out how can you tell if there is and what can be done. Um, what does a speech and language pathologist do? So there is a lot of help available to you. And um, Dr. Evan Lippman is a speech and language pathologist with over 30 years of experience. And in fact, she's prompt certified for verbal apraxia. I know many of you hear those terms sometimes um, when you're, you have a child who you're wondering about speech and language, you'll ask what that means. Um, but uh, Dr. Lippman is actually the person that we at Testing Mom go to when we have questions, when our parents have questions about speech and language issues with their kids. Um, and she's affiliated with Mount Sinai Hospital and Medical School where she works with premature infants and young children. Um, she's, she actually lectures to the doctors and the interns on speech and language uh, development there. Um, and she works with families all over the country online these days, I, I understand. Is that right? You're doing a lot of online therapy right now. Yes, Karen, it's really working out well. Thank you. Okay, that, well, thanks for being here. Thank you for being our expert today because uh, we know you know your stuff. So let's get started. And the first question I have is, you know, a, as a mom or a dad, if you're wondering um, whether or not your child has a speech and language delay, what things might be happening that, that could be getting you to, to think there could be something going on? So younger children, um, there's a, a lot of bullet points there. Um, <laughs> so basically, if your child is between two and five, is not using words to communicate their wants and needs, if they're trying to pull you to what they want, um, uh, doesn't enjoy being read to, um, and just struggles with following directions, that's a receptive language problem. In older children, uh, it, ma it can manifest by not following directions in school, um, difficulty with what people say to them, difficulty um, reading and spelling, and difficulty with focus and attention in older children. Mm. And, and um, in my case, I know my son had, um, had speech delays and it was because of his hearing difficulties. He had a history of, of ear infections. So I, I guess that's something you must see a lot too with younger kids, right? Yes, but I think we discussed that on, um, yes, if there's a history of ear infections, mm -hmm. uh, there's usually a, car, a, a relationship between uh, chronic ear infections and late speech talkers. Uh -huh. And that can be, that has to be evaluated and treated by a speech therapist. Right, right. Yeah, that's what happened with Sam. He had the same, he had learning delays because of hearing delays and, and speech delays as well. So um, I had a daughter with the same thing as Sam. So, uh -huh. um, but now, now they're both grown, right, Karen? And right, they're doing right. well. <laughs> so early intervention or intervention at any age is helpful. It definitely is. I, I know both of us, we've talked about this before, about how we, we stepped in to help our kids mm -hmm. when they were young and they had these delays. My, my son had them and um, so, uh, mm -hmm. and it was hearing that led to speech. Um, now, I, I wanna just talk about the different types of delays. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about language delays. So what are we talking about today versus maybe speech disorders, which are a little different. We'll talk about those another day. Okay, speech disorders um, fall under a different umbrella. Yeah. And so I'm not gonna touch upon that. Like Karen said, let's, let's wait for another time. This mm -hmm. Receptive language in younger and older children is the inability to comprehend what is spoken to them. So if they're asked to go pick up their shoes in their room and bring it to you, 
-hmm. it's not maybe naughty, terrible twos. It may be that they don't understand the direction. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes up the hierarchy with older children. They have difficulty understanding uh, directions orally versus what the teacher puts on the board. Mm -hmm. um, it can manifest um, in low frustration tolerance with younger and older children. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually um, something that's a uh, glaring, obvious issue, mm -hmm. either with young children or older, because if they're not understanding, to me as a speech pathologist with over 30 years experience, they're not understanding. Therefore, the specialist is a speech pathologist to do a thorough evaluation, to have a baseline if the child has comprehension problems. Expressive language delays are also done at the same time on a test, a standardized test, and the children with expressive language delays is defined as, you know, late talkers, mm -hmm. but late talkers, are they following just the milestones of acquiring words, or is it they're not following what your older siblings did or what their peers are? That would be when you would go to a speech pathologist when they have very little words, uh, when they're older and they have difficulty in, ele in elementary school with word math problems, difficulty mm -hmm. writing simple stories, um, and um, that's the difference. And to keep it simple, that's what the difference is between comprehension delays mm -hmm. and an expressive ability to ex the child for the ability to express themselves. And if they have a thorough evaluation and they need intervention, there are strategies that we will talk about later that will help them. Great. And, and so what, what does the speech, I mean, you, you touched on this, but what would a speech uh, pathologist do to give a diagnosis of language delays? Most speech pathologists, we don't know the child when we meet the child. So right. we do standardized testing, which mm -hmm. in English means that we ask questions um, about comprehension and questions where they have to talk. And then the test is analyzed and we see where they are strong and where they're weak. And if they are um, diagnostically delayed enough that they need speech therapy to catch up. So that's simple. Um, and that's the best way to evaluate is with standardized testing. Got it. Um, and I know you, you always say that you want to rule out medical issues, um, especially hearing issues um, uh, right around the time or before you start speech therapy. And, and, and I know sometimes there can be other issues that the speech pathologist might uncover as you start working with the child. So if you could just talk a little bit about some of the medical issues that sometimes might accompany a child who ends up going for speech therapy. Okay, well, what I want to begin with by saying is I do have a dual degree in audiology undergraduate. Mm -hmm. What that means is um, they do a hearing test in the pediatrician's office. Don't be fooled because it's, a, it's just a sound test and anybody can pass it and they still might have a hearing loss. So the best person to go to is who you see, an audiologist always, because if we do speech therapy and it turns out a child might have some fluid in the ears, um, then the child's not going to learn how to talk or is not going to learn more comprehension skills. So the audiologist will tell you if there's a problem or not, and that will also change the way we do therapy. A vision pediatric optometrist is usually um, referred to by a speech pathologist that's been treating a child, knows the child, checks in with the teacher, and asks if he rubs the eyes in class or if they have difficulty, um, you know, uh, headaches. Um, and this is different than just going to an eye doctor for an eye checkup for glasses. You need to find a pediatric optometrist that does testing that is vision disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, it's more common than you think and is definitely covered by insurance. The audiology eval and the vision. Uh, neuropsychology testing is really only done when a child has uh, is very fidgety, doesn't sit still, um, and that's usually also made by the teacher or the team, the teacher, the speech pathologist, or perhaps if there's another therapist on the team, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to the pediatrician, 
and see if that evaluation is warranted. Got it. Okay. So, and I know that sometimes, um, you know, th these, these issues all kind of impact each other. So that's why it's important to uh, listen if your speech therapist says, you know, I think you might want to check on vision or you might want to check on, get a, a, a neuropsychological evaluation. Um, Cause I know it all kind of runs together. I know we went to all of these doctors <laughs> with my kids. Me as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so what is the best way to find a good speech therapist for your child? What, what suggestions can you give parents? Okay. This slide is, full of good information so read it carefully mm -hmm. but because of time i want to just keep it simple um if you're worried about who's the best speech evaluator for my child pediatricians keep a book of doctors they refer to so they will they should have at least two or three speech pathologists you can call that you could uh, call your insurance company to get a list of speech language pathologists that is covered by your insurance you can get it for free through three platforms. Early intervention is birth to three. Uh, three to five is called Committee of Preschool Spe Special Education, also for free. And mm -hmm. through the Department of Education, your school district, you can also get services for free. Mm -hmm. um, I want to qualify that if there is hearing loss or if there is uh, tongue tie, a muscle like where the tongue is preventing them from saying sentences. Um, that's important to provide that information to your school district as um, doesn't matter how old they are, it still will give, it, it automatically, the Department of Education has to service the child. So okay. please make sure you advocate for your child at any age. Great, okay. Um... And I know that, that when you're getting services, if you have insurance, you can sometimes combine uh, what you're getting through the Department of Education and what your insurance company will allow as well. So you can get extra services and extra support to just move your child through the uh, whatever speech and language issue they may be having. That's an excellent um, point that I didn't make. And no, I just by the way, don't, don't be afraid if you go through EI or, Mm -hmm. that we talked about, they're going to charge your insurance, but you can still do it through your insurance. So don't be afraid that if you are doing one for free through the Department of Education, yeah. you can get a speech therapist through your insurance also. So two speech therapists you can get. Yeah, that's good. And get just lots of support. So that's, that's important. Um, so if you have a child who's getting, who's been diagnosed with uh, receptive language delays, can you talk about some of the ways that a um, speech therapist would actually work on, on um, with these delays that? Okay. This says it in one word. Go huh. to, te to testingmoms.com. Oh. <laughs> Doc, I'm, I don't make my, any money off this. Okay. This is what you can do seven days a week with your child to help with receptive language, young children and older children. That's, that's the, just to clarify, those are our, just, those are our kindergarten in a box. If you, but they can be used all the kindergarten they, in a box, but yeah. yeah. Kindergarten in a box, set one and set two are fabulous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This book that uh, uh, Karen Quinn wrote um, is and, the Bible. Okay. And I think it was only $18 and it's worth every penny. Mm -hmm. So um, I, and her flashcards are fabulous. So I suggest parents who are hands-on or want to help their children, these are resources through testingmom.com store. You can look at them, you can read about them and buy them. And they're, they're very well priced and um, you can give them to your speech pathologist. You can give them to the tutor. To, and what, what kinds of things do you like to do when you're working with little kids? What, what's your, some of your go-to activities that, that um, you know, for a child with a receptive language uh, delay? Okay, so receptive language delay, we want to start with the pictures that you see, puzzles that are easy with, with a wood knob um, mm -hmm. where they just have to put it in. Um, shape sorters, uh, I block usually all the shapes except to see the red triangle. I would hold it up at eye level and say, 
say red triangle and put it in. Mm -hmm. So it's basically drill work. And with, with reading like brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I use singing because um, they enjoy it. You have to make it fun for kids. Like yeah. a little blue truck or we're going on a bear hunt. And a little bunny foo who, who not smacks everybody. And he's naughty and gets turned into a goon. So inflection, intonation, silliness, um, like, oh, Miss Evans said it with a lisp. Oh, no, I have to do it again. Sally, Thor, seashells. And then the child says back to me, no, Dr. No, Dr. Evans. I say, oh, again, Sally sees seashells. <laughs> so that's a strategy. Um, board games are great at any age. Um, and um, really the family has to be part of the process and trophies or certificates for reinforcement are always helpful. Okay, great. And what about older children with receptive language delays? What kinds of things might you do with them? Uh, tape recorder is very old school and I still use it. What <laughs> that means is if a child has comprehension problems and they're school age, we actually do the homework assignment where I ask the child to read the directions and then we talk about the answers and then we do two or three questions, stop it, rewind it, play it back. And I ask the child, is that what you really wanted to say? 90% of the time we repeat it two or three times mm -hmm. and they're happy with the result. So that's the strategy that a speech pathologist would use uh, doing homework and using a tape recorder. You cut it up just for a second. So I just want to ask you, did you say what the child reads the directions into the recorder or just, is that what you have the child do? First, first, first Dr. Evan does it. Like, we, well, again, we make it a game. I'm yeah. first. And they're like, no, I'm first. I'm like, and I'm like a five-year-old. No, I'm first. Uh -huh. So they say, all right, let's pick a number, one to five. I'm thinking of a number. What number? So yeah. they'll go three. And I'm like, oh, you're one. You go first. Now read the directions. Read it. And, okay. then we, and then we go through the activity and I'm like, yay, Johnny, you got it right. You see, you can read the sentence. Okay. So a lot of, you know, cheerleading. Um, mm -hmm. they, they like action. They like to be silly and they like it to be fun. And that's what we want it to be for our children. We want to advocate self-esteem, building uh, confidence, okay. asking for help when they're stuck. Okay. Great. And so, and tell me about expressive language delays, because this is... Well, this is my favorite with young yeah. children. My favorite. Karen has this game. Woof. It's about a dog, for example, <laughs> and I can hit all the bullet points with this. Woof is a game where shake, 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 and find the dog. They have to find the color hair, and they have to find... Um... Hold on a sec. Bear with me. So, Miss Evan, Dr. Evan does this, shake, 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 and find the dog. Singing has been shown to help children process language. Then what they have to do, depending on the age, I can use this game for kids up to six, from two up until 13. What they have to do is they have to identify the hair, the color of the collar, the action of the dog. They have to put it into a sentence if it's young children. If it's older children, they have to tell a story and give the doggy a name. It's okay. perfect. Uh-huh. So you Great use that game. a lot. I love that game. <laughs> yeah, and there's 10 bones, and then I always say, you're cheating. And they're like, no, you're cheating, nine to seven. So... It's great. And blowing bubbles with young children in the bathtub if you don't want to mess. You can also use shaving cream and hide cars and objects. And then they have to, like, hide and seek. So there's so many different ways to help with um, expressive language in, with children. You know, get the candy land. You know, get the regular memory game. Um, you know, you can read what's there. Any uh, Party City is the last thing I'm going to say because okay. you can get kazoos and whistles, so Google that. And how about older children with expressive delays? What are some things to do with them? Well, there's a lot of fun things to do, believe it or not, and they love it. Between six and 13, dot to dot, they wanna win. It's We race each other who can do the numbers the fastest or the letters the fastest. And then I say, help, I say stop. If you're stuck, stop and ask Miss Evan for help. So um, finger tracing and pencil tracing mazes, makes them, it just builds more confidence for them to s explain what they're doing. Because if they're doing it physically, they can explain it. Um, and then uh, not asking your child too many 
abstract questions like, where does Santa Claus live? You know, try to keep language simple, keep questions simple, like, why are, why are you upset? What's bothering you? Keep it very simple um, and reward the child always. Whenever they do something, be their cheerleader like Mary Poppins. And they will, that reinforcement will, you know, motivate them to keep doing better. And I know you said that in writing, it's important that they be able to first tell a story with a beginning, middle, and end before they can write a story. So Right. Let me just reinforce that quickly. If a child can say the three little pigs orally, mm -hmm. then they can write a story about the three little pigs. But if they cannot tell an oral story, that means their expressive language skills are delayed and you're asking them to do a task that's impossible for them to complete at this time. Okay, got it. So that's that's something that you would do first before you would have them write it. Right. Um, now, any any just hints for parents besides you know what what else they can do at home besides my wonderful cards. <laughs> Thank you. Bring for out your cards again, up. please, because because it, because uh, they no yeah, you know great. what you know why these sets are important. You can uh -huh. make you can make them. A speech pathologist can teach you how to make something easier for younger children or harder. So these mm -hmm. kindergarten sets I have used on younger children, but mm -hmm. I modif I changed the language. So what's really important with younger children? Nursery rhymes, I didn't mention that. Um, mm -hmm. the wheels on the bus, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Make it fun, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, you know, and do the hokey pokey. Um, that's the way to get expressive language. Um, with older kids, um, you know, uh, have them uh, play board games and pretend that you're, you know, you're going to win and they want to win and make it competitive so they forget they're doing a language activity. So mm -hmm. you make it all about, no way, you didn't get to the King Candyland before me. You cheated. So, you know, you just make it fun. Okay, keep it fun. And here are some great suggestions. You can, you can stop the video and look at it and uh, make sure that you try some of these activities with your kids at home. Oh, did um, I mention this book, Karen? Which one? Which one? Oh, yes, you did. You meant, I think you did at the beginning. That's on okay. our website. I can't help mentioning it again because uh -huh. this, what we're about to talk about on this slide, yeah. there, there, there's, this is readable. It's still relevant and current and it's only $18 and it's worth every penny. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, you can get that on our website as well. Thank you very much. I love the plugs. That's great. So let me talk about um, the first question. Some of these commonly asked questions that, that parents ask, um, one being a lot of times kids have behaviors that worry them, like maybe they don't make eye contact or they, they, they spin their toys or they line them up versus playing with them or they aren't as affectionate as they could be and they worry about autism. And I know that these kinds of individual symptoms do not automatically mean autism, but what would you recommend if they are worried about any um, any kinds of, you know, about autism or, okay. or any specific? Yeah, let me, let me just speak to the, the, the bullet points. Yeah. So autism um, is very obvious in young children. They, they spin wheels of toys. They um, are not affectionate. They don't make eye contact. They're, quir they're weird. They're just weird. They just their don't. Their behavior might be off. Then. Yeah, they just, they just don't know how to interact. Okay. There's usually what we call comorbidity with autism, which is uh, meaning they may, may be autistic, meaning receptive and expressive language problems, but they could also have play delays. So if you see your child is not playing like with a train set, that's, that's a sign that, you know, he's spinning the wheels upside down of all the trains and, and does that over and over again, it's a problem. So I would say that child, parents who are reading this right now, you probably have a sense that your child is in the autistic spectrum after reading this, if you identify with it. Um, children who are not speaking, and may, what's the difference between a late bloomer or perhaps a language delay? Um, again, it's a child who is behind their friends in using words and every day to communicate 
their wants and needs, like for example, what they want for snack, they would go to the refrigerator and point to the orange so the mother would know to cut up the orange. Mm -hmm. That's an example. Um, how long does treatment take for speech delays? That is something um, that takes time with therapy. And if it's a good speech therapist, they'll give you a range of time depending on the diagnosis. And be believe me, I, as a speech pathologist, want to cure the child and, and discharge them because then I've done my job. So um, you, you, it, it's, it's, it's a child, it's child specific, basically. That's when you know when you begin and when you end. Okay. And the most concerning thing I get phone calls about is they're working with a speech pathologist for a while and they're frustrated they don't see progress with their child. Yeah. They feel guilty about going for a second opinion. I tell people that you're advocating for your child who's not talking. So going for a second opinion will either give you peace of mind that it's just taking time for some reason, or maybe there's another direction to go with a different speech pathologist. So you would, so you see that a lot. So that's something to, to, to do if you're not, if you don't think your child is making progress. I would say, to, I tell parents prognostically, I tell parents give a therapist two months. And if two months, there's not really any progress, get a second opinion. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, and some more questions that we, we hear. Any other? Um, we talked about mastery, which in English means the child has met their goals. Yay! <laughs> and we say we give them a trophy or a certificate and yeah. we make it a, like a party because they've yeah. done so well. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between a two? I get this a lot, a tutor and a speech pathologist. Um, a speech pathologist goes to graduate school to work on um, uh, comprehension delays in a special way and work on expressive language delays in a special way a tutor tends to carry over um, what they're doing in school, which is great, or at grade level. Um, they complement each other. So um, that's what's very important to know. You can have a, a great speech pathologist and a great tutor, and they can even communicate and be a team because a collaborative effort is what's best for the child. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, so if, uh, if Parents have any additional questions? Um, would you be okay if they just email you with their specific questions about maybe their child or if they're questions about whether or not it, there's a receptive or expressive language delays? Um, can they reach out to you? Uh, anyone who's watching this, um, <laughs> I have tremendous respect for Karen Quinn. I would say that um, I'm happy to speak with you 10 to 15 minutes about your child's concerns mm -hmm. and guide you perhaps maybe if a child does need interventions or type of evaluations, mm -hmm. it's maybe 10 or 15 minutes. I'm happy to do that. Oh, wonderful. Well, we appreciate that. We really do. And we appreciate all the time you gave us today. Thank you so much. Um, learned a lot. And um, you know, I, I hope this uh, makes parents feel better that um, if there's any kind of delay, there's certainly a lot of things you can do about it. Um, and there's a lot of support out there in terms of getting services. Um, so thanks for being here with us, Dr. Lippman. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.